Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I am a dental surgeon and also the course director for an online series of lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology into their clinical practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course and long-term mentorship study club program so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the didactic online program. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. Lecture 8, Pre-Prosthetic Assessment. So basically when you get to the pre-prosthetic assessment, the question becomes, can we restore this implant? Has this implant healed and can we restore it? So we have a checklist, once again another checklist, for the confirmation of osseointegration. integration. And basically this rolls down like this. Number one, dental implant stability has been confirmed. So unlike back in 1978, back in Harvard, where some sort of mobility with an implant was acceptable, an implant has to be stable. If there's any mobility, this is considered a failure. Number two, there has to be the absence of pain. Number three, the peri-implant soft tissues have to be healthy. Number four, the radiographs have to confirm stable peri-implant bone. Number five, the patient has to be appointed for a prosthetic restoration. And finally, number six, the report to the prosthetic dentist needs to be prepared and sent. So with this in mind, we need to verify that implants have also integrated by a number of things, basically by palpation, percussion, reverse torque testing, radio frequency analysis, so that would be things like the Austell appliance, uh, and radiographic evaluation in terms of confirming he uh, healing peri-implant bone. And then uh, there needs to be, if the need, there may be a need for a transitional denture. So this is basically to test implants, test aesthetics, uh, and any changes to the occlusal scheme that have taken place. It's also a question about when and how to load a dental implant. So in the past, we've talked about progressive loading. So you don't have to just go from, like, say, an implant to, boom, a crown. You can go, you can progressively load the implant with things like varying sizes and diameters of healing abutments. There also has to be an evaluation of the soft tissue adequacy around the implants. So if it's the case that you need to augment the soft tissue in terms of changing the soft tissue biotype or grafting connective tissue in the area, this can be considered at this point. There also has to be thoughts put forward about creation of an emergence profile. Uh, patients are coming to you to basically get something which is going to be biomimetic or aesthetic. So you can't just have an implant and then like a large space and then boom, a crown. You want to have a nice emergence profile for this crown to make it look like it's coming out of the tissue like a natural tooth. And then finally, there has to be consideration of the contraindications to uh, immediate implant placement, which we will cover in the immediate implant placement lecture. So implant success and survival. So basically, individual unattached implant is immo immobile when tested clinically. Radiograph does not demonstrate any evidence of peri-implant radiolucency. Vertical bone loss is less than 0.2 millimeters annually following the implant's first year of service. Uh, individual implant performance is characterized by an absence of persistent and or irreversible signs or symptoms such as pain, infection, neuropathies, paresthesia, or violation of the mandibular canal. And in the context of the above, a success rate of about 85% at the end of five years observation period and 80% at the end of a 10-year period are the minimum criteria for success for a particular implant. And this is the new criteria that were put forward by Dr. Albertson, Zarb, Worthington, and Erickson back in 1986 in their article termed the long-term efficacy of current used, currently used dental implants, a review of, and proposed criteria for success. In 2008, this was updated by Dr. Carl Misch, the 2008 success criteria, success, survival, and failure. And basically, we'd covered this in one of the previous lectures in describing implants as success or as survival with satisfactory health or survival with compromised health, and then finally, a definition for failure. So the 2008 success criteria is sort of what we work with now, and this has sort of come a long ways from those 1978 Harvard uh, criteria that were developed. 
So early exposure to the oral environment, basically these are just cate uh, categorizations or sorry, classifications for when implants are exposed early on. We're just including this as part of this lecture. Uh, many times people are the surgical dentist and then there's a restorative dentist. So uh, many times you'll find that the implant has been exposed to the oral environment early. The basic problem with this is exposure to oral bacteria and any subsequent effect this may have with respect to the soft tissues around the implant and also uh, bone loss. So let's take a look at a few cases now. Basically, we're talking about stage two surgery. So more or less, you have the implants, they're underneath the tissue. How do you get to them? So uh, many times, uh, you, you have a surgical dentist and a prosthetic dentist, and in many cases, you are the surgical and prosthetic dentist. So how do you get at these implants? So in my practice, there's generally a few things that we take a look at. So number one is you want to get some sort of anesthesia for the patient because if the implants are not exposed in the mouth, as in the cases that we described previously, uh, you need to get to them. So getting some anesthesia in there is always good. And usually in our office, we use one of two methods to do a stage two procedure. We use either an H incision or a tissue punch. The basic difference between these two is that the H incision basically is the form of an H and you basically just make two flaps on either side of the implant which helps preserve a lot of the cratinized tissue and soft tissue and connective tissue around the implant, whereas the tissue punch is basically uh, sort of like a, one of those biopsy punches and you just sort of remove uh, whatever tissue is on top of the uh, implant. There's different indications for either of these procedures and we'll go over a few cases that sort of highlights both of these procedures. Basically, it comes down to maintenance of cratinized tissue around the implants and the placement of healing abutments afterwards. So let's talk about our first case. So first case is a 72-year healthy female who's seeking a replacement for a failed maxillary left central incisor. And she's seeking a more aesthetic smile. And she has an impacted maxillary left, left uh, cuspid. So upon review of this radiograph here, you can see in this patient's case, uh, she basically has broken a tooth. She's got that impacted cuspid. This lady is older. We did consult my colleague. He was an orthodontist who basically said that you're probably more likely to find Jimmy Hoffa than to extrude that uh, upper left uh, cuspid for this patient. And so clinically, we take a look at this patient. You can see that yeah, you can see why she's seeking a more aesthetic smile. Despite the fact that she's 72 years old, uh, it doesn't matter what age people get to, people always want to look good. So taking a look at this radiograph, you can see the fractured tooth. In this particular case, the patient actually came to me with the fractured 2-1 or, or uh, left maxillary central incisor. And more or less, the only way I could restore it for her that day, because she had to go to some sort of a seniors event uh, that day, was to basically do a prophylactic endo, uh, cement a post, and glue this tooth back in for her. Uh, I didn't feel honest charging her any money for this, so I sort of just did this uh, as, as recreational as a recreational event. Uh, however, she came back and she wanted a more definitive solution. And basically, I told her the solution based off the way things are presenting, the best course to go here is something like a dental implant solution. There's options in terms of removal of partial dentures and bridges and all types of other things. But in this particular case, an implant solution is what she wanted. So the treatment plan, uh, after so basically we take a look at this panoral radiograph you can see what we're planning here based off the bone loss and the lack of aesthetics in the anterior maxilla is uh, the extraction of the four maxillary incisors extraction of that premolar uh, there are some case studies about taking implants and drilling them into teeth uh, i didn't want to experiment in this particular case with these uh, case reports that have been published from about 2009 and onwards it's 2015 when this presentation is going forward uh, so in this particular case, we plan to basically extract that uh, maxilla maxillary uh, left second premolar and basically place an implant in that area in close proximity to the follicle of that unerupted cuspid. So we take a look at the next slide here. We basically talk about uh, take a look at the, sorry a closer pic uh, of that picture of that uh, premolar and where that impacted eye tooth is. And clinically, you can sort of see retracted. This is what things look like. And here's an occlusal shot of the patient and the treatment plan. Okay, so the treatment plan for this case is basically going to be an orthodontic consult. As I already advised you, the, the orthodontist, the senior most orthodontist in our area, basically advised me you, I'm more likely to find Jimmy Hoffa than to extract or extrude, orthodontically extrude that eye tooth to basically allow it to, uh, to uh, uh, be a part of our restorative solution. 
Uh, we also didn't want to extract the tooth. The patient didn't want to go through the morbidity associated with trying to extract that impacted eye tooth. So we talked about we talk about extraction of basically four maxillary incisors and the second maxillary left maxillary premolar and the placement of five dental implants for the retention of a fixed bridge and then adjustment of the mandibular occlusal plane for the patient to give her a nicer occlusal plane and also to give us or facilitate for our lab technician more room to give this patient the golden proportion or the aesthetic smile that she's seeking. And then finally, a bite plate, just to ensure that this uh, implant solution is going to be something that lasts a long time for her. So you can see in this photograph here, we're basically taking our index finger and our thumb to sort of feel the bone and rotate, rotate, and get an atraumatic extraction of the central incisor. If one's not familiar with this, we do have a few case presentations highlighting how to do a atraumatic extraction, or as I like to term, a minimally traumatic extraction. So you can see in this photograph, the tooth, first tooth has been taken out. And here's that extraction socket, just the residual socket that's remaining. And you can see that we've taken all the, the maxillary incisors out now. You can see in that one picture, they're the right first maxillary central incisor on the right side. Uh, you can see the little osteotomy that we made in that dense palatal bone to sort of retain a implant in the dense bone. And you can see here we're basically doing, continuing our osteotomies with our progressive set of twist drills. And in this photograph here, you can see we're placing that first implant. So we basically use that first implant to sort of as a, as a, as a gauge to basically uh, use as a guide to have parallelism with the placement of the rest of the implants. So you can see here that the rest of the implants have been placed and there's some significant gap jump junctions on the buccal aspects of uh, the residual sockets. And you can see here we're basically doing the first guide pin drill in that posterior uh, premolar area. So the premolar has been taken out, and we're just trying to stay away from that uh, eye tooth. As I mentioned, there are case reports of drilling into or what they call dental integration of implants. However, we don't want to uh, do that in this particular case. That's not our intention. So continuing along here and placing an implant in that premolar region, once again, there will be a significant gap or jump junction in this area as well. And finally, after torquing everything down, you can see that these implants have some cover screws in place. So once the cover screws are in place, you can adapt some bone graft. Here's a panel radiograph showing all the implants in place. And you can see that we've basically put some graft into the uh, buckle segments or the gap jump junctions, placed some platelet-rich fibrin and a couple of figure eight sutures to help retain those platelet-rich fibrin segments. So healing time and weeks later, so remember the entire crux of this entire lecture is to talk about ways of getting that pre-prosthetic assessment done. So how do we get to those implants? So in this particular case, we're going to be using a tissue punch. And so this is a tissue punch right here. You can see a picture of it. And more or less, you have to have some sort of like Jedi powers and sort of knowing where those implants are. So you basically just punch in, you know, use an explorer or something to sort of like, uh, you know, finish up that cut and you can sort of expose these implants. So this is usually done in cases where you aren't going to benefit from that additional connective tissue or soft tissue around the implants. So if it's a case you have minimal attached tissue or the tissue biotype is kind of thin, you may want to consider something like the H incision which we're going to cover next. So you can see here we place some heal, uh, some uh, uh, transfer copings. We've locked these together with composite resin. Uh, before we get to the prosthetic phase lecture, there are some studies that have been done. The best way to lock these things together is with GC pattern resin. Number two is with composite resin. Number three is with something like triad. So the visual, uh, the sorry, I think it's called VLC, visual light cure or visible light curing uh, uh, polymethyl methacrylate. The problem with those things is there's crazy shrinkage with those. So you're going to get some distortion uh, with this as a, as a verification jig. So use pattern resin if you can afford the time to use it. I just like using composite resin. So as you can see, just do something like this. Yeah, it costs you more money, but you know what? Uh, it takes time to mix pattern resin as well. So that's the, sort of the way I see things, but uh, this works fairly well for me. So in the next picture, you can see a photograph with all the impression copings seated down. So you want to take this shot to make sure everything's seated. There's no point in, in having it not seated and getting something inaccurate sent back from the lab. And you can also see that the composite resin is locking these things in place. So we take a fixture level impression. Here's the impression you can see that we've taken. I, in my office, I like to take the abutment analogs or the fixture analogs and put those in. Here's a photograph showing those fixture analogs all in place. And 
you send that back to the lab and put some healing abutments in place. You can see some healing abutments are put in here. Uh, this is after doing the, uh, the uh, tissue punch in order to access these implants. And so the end this case is in progress. So moving on to the next case, we we're going to talk about an H incision. We have a 37-year-old healthy male who's missing the 1-4 and 1-5. This was lo traumatically lost 15 years ago. And I don't have a photograph of it here, but there was a significant buccal bone deficiency in this particular patient's case. So we had to consider some sort of a buccal bone graft or onlay bone graft with a bicortical screw. So the treatment plan for this patient was a buccal onlay bone graft with the placement of two dental implants and the provision of an FPD to replace the missing 1-4, 1-5. So in this photograph, you can see that we actually put the buccal bone graft in place and we were able to place the first implant and more or less, we were able to place a second implant. Now, I know these implants are a bit close, but you'll have to trust me, this is going to work well. We sort of threaded the needle by having the buccal onlay bone graft with the pin holding the implant, sorry, holding that buccal onlay bone graft in between the two implants that were placed. So six months of healing time was given and we finally go back with an H incision. So you can see in this photograph right here, it's basically just an H. And it's just like two trap doors on either side. And what this allows you to do is sort of access the, the implants and also put those healing abutments on and maintain all of that, hard, that uh, connective tissue in between. So you'll see right here in the next picture, we've sort of exposed that uh, buccal onlay uh, bone graft. We removed that screw from this patient and put some healing abutments down, a couple stitches inside there. And you'll see when this patient comes back that that's what the patient looks like. You can still, still sort of see the outline of that H incision, but nonetheless, it's healing nicely. And we remove these healing abutments and just take a look at that tissue. Wow, that looks really nice, right? Trust me, it still looks like that right now. This case is from two years ago. And in the radiograph, you can see that we took well, I took this. I guess I took the impression while the screw was still in, but I assure you that screw, the screw that was retaining that buccal onlay bone graft, that is gone now. And here's the impression. And in the impression, we put those. Uh, we put the uh, transfer copings or the uh, the fixture analogs on again. Once again, send these off to the lab with the appropriate wax UCLA abutments. You can see them right here. And when we get this back, basically you evaluate it from the lab perspective. We had these two te teeth fused just because we were uh, putting onlay bone grafts in this area. Uh, any sort of grafted bone never quite is like natural bone. So I'm always a bit iffy. So as opposed to giving the guy two separate crowns, I said, you know, what, let's split these thing to things together and get the support from splinting in this particular case. And intraoral, you can see this is what it looks like. Beautiful, nice emergence profile. We restore those UCLA abutments, or sorry, the screw axis holes with some composite resin and some Teflon, and it looks great. So the H incision again, another case here. We saw this case in the surgical phase. This is my uh, a friend of mine who uh, works in the trades. Placed an implant in the 1-4 position. This is what it looked like when he came back. So once again, there you go. There's a beautiful H. We let it bleed a little bit just to sort of amplify or, or dramatize the effect of that H a little bit more for you. I take a little Woodson elevator, help sort of trap door open that tissue up and we put a healing abutment in there. And you can see that that tissue is moved buccally and lingually and really helps augment the soft tissue biotype around this particular patient's case. And we take a impression coping, put that in place, another open tray impression. You can see the open tray. Make sure that that open tray fits. Take an open tray impression. Here it is taken. We put the, the abutment or fixture analog onto that impression, send it off with a USCLA abutment. In this particular case, the lab told me that uh, mia culpa, I was a little bit too buckal in terms of placing this implant, so we weren't able to have a screw-retained uh, crown in this particular case. So we had to have a cemented crown, so you can see the abutment in place. This has been torqued in. Here's a radiograph of it seated. You can see it's beautifully seated. There's a beautiful adaptation uh, to that implant. Uh, and here is the final crown that's cemented. You can see that the tissues that are, are around the H incision, they're sort of bleeding a bit. This is sort of on purpose. And the basic purpose of this is you sort of have the lab contour the crown. So it's kind of over contoured so that when you when you cement it or put the screw retained crown in that, that forces this immature tissue that you made your H incision with to sort of open up. And if you bring this patient back, and unfortunately I haven't seen this patient in a, in a little while, if you bring this patient back and take another picture, this will have the most gorgeous emergence profile you've ever seen in your life. So other uses, uses of the H incision, you can see in this particular case, a patient who we uh, placed some locators on, we did a little bit of H incision here. Basically, you're trying to augment the, 
uh, soft tissue biotype around these, in this case, is asked to anchor locators for the retention of a uh, complete uh, lower denture. Uh, you can also uh, basically help ensure that this, uh, uh, this tissue is going to be nice and thick in this area as well. Not just keratinized tissue, but nice thick tissue. So the next lecture is lecture nine, the prostatic phase. This is the big, big enchilada from a, the prostatic perspective. Uh, we're going to make sure it's comprehensive enough so that it covers a lot of interesting cases. And, and the cases that we can't cover, we'll call, cover uh, in the lecture called uh, multidisciplinary cases. So once again, I've included all the references that we used in the production of this lecture series. And on behalf of the entire dental treatment team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you for listening to our lecture. Thank you.